1892, Edward Drinker Cope held the fragments of two bones in his hands. Strange, giant, porous vertebrae from the Hell Creek beds of South Dakota. To him, it seemed like the worn remains of some giant horned plant eater, so he named it Manospondylus gigas. What he couldn't have realized was that he was looking at the very first fossil of the most famous predator to ever walk the earth. That small misidentification would spark technically one of the longest and oddest naming mishaps in paleontology. Imagine standing on a vista in South Dakota during the 1890s with a beautiful overview of buttes and prairies. No phones, no laptops, no Wi-Fi, no cars, planes, pollution, or, well, much of anything. After chipping away at a ledge of mudstone, you gingerly pull out not one, but two partial vertebrae that bear the unmistakable anatomical signatures of the dinosaurs. Back in the 1890s, the formal study of paleontology was still relatively new. Not in its infancy, but still finding out enormous chunks of information at record speed. Dinosaurs were new, and fantastic specimens were rare. This reflected itself in the rush to describe and name nearly every single fragment of fossil etched with slightly different anatomical shapes to those fragments already known to science. This is why there are so many species and genus names attributed to teeth that can no longer be considered valid names. This also led to the Bone Wars, a period of time during the late 1800s in which two of the most famous American paleontologists of the time, Othniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope, competed against one another to find the most and name the most, whatever it was. Oligocene mammal, Jurassic dinosaur, or Cretaceous croc. One of the many victims to this period of time were the pair of porous vertebrae I had you imagine digging up. Sometime prior to 1892, Cope found a pair of weird vertebrae he had never seen before. He published a very brief description of these bones in 1892 in the journal Naturalist. A few decades prior to this discovery, in the 1870s, Cope had discovered and described the partial remains of a ceratopsian, or horned dinosaur, from Cretaceous rock layers of Wyoming. This animal was named Agathomus and was the basis for the first grouping of horned dinosaurs known to science, the Agathomidae. Many more horned dinosaurs would be discovered in the decades after this, forcing a complete rearrangement of the group and validation or invalidation of many fragmentary remains. That led to the Ceratopsia group and Triceratops as the best known mascot of the group. You can get a much broader understanding of the history of this in my video on Agathomus, which you can find in the description and comment section below. This is relevant to Tyrannosaurus and the two mystery vertebrae because Cope didn't have a lot of references to use to compare and contrast against new fossils. He was especially lacking in manuscripts of theropod dinosaur skeletons, you know, the big two-legged mostly carnivores. As such, he saw some shared traits, including size and gross shape, and concluded that the vertebrae were one of the horned dinosaurs, a member of his group, the Agathomidae so he named them Manospondylus gigas. We shouldn't be too harsh on him, since the only definitive theropod dinosaur fossils known at the time were teeth, or remains so obviously not Ornithischian or sauropod as to stand out, like ostrich dinosaur fossils. So, if no teeth were found with these vertebrae, Cope had no way of knowing what he found was not a horned dinosaur. Sometimes the field of paleontology can seem to progress at a glacial pace, other times it's like a waterfall. This was the case all the way back at the turn of the 19th century too. Despite the fact that there was a fraction of a fraction of the paleontologists working then as there are now, some finds were published quickly, and others quite slowly. The unassuming nature of the Manospondylus vertebrae resigned the specimens to the literal dust drawers of history. 
Well, sort of. All of this is a roundabout way to say that the crappy fossil stayed in a drawer at the American Museum of Natural History for over a decade before another paleontologist got around to taking a second look at them. Said paleontologist was the third or fourth most well-known dinosaur hunter at the time, John Bell Hatcher, who was hired to go out and find fossils for both Cope and Marsh over the years. Hatcher published a reanalysis of the bones of Manispondylus in 1907, suggesting they actually belonged among the theropod dinosaurs. By that time, a better understanding of what traits told the ceratopsians apart from the theropods had been worked out. Another decade would pass before even this conclusion would be reevaluated by another expert. At the time that Manospondylus had been reassigned to the Theropoda, paleontologists at the American Museum of Natural History were finding some of the best and biggest theropod material on expeditions to Montana and Wyoming. Specifically, assistant curator of the museum, Barnum Brown, had led these expeditions and successfully found a much less fragmentary group of bones in Wyoming in 1900, and then an even better specimen in Montana in 1902. Head of the museum and disgusting eugenicist racist Henry Fairfield Osborne published on these specimens in 1905, before they had been fully prepared. He named the Montanan specimen Tyrannosaurus rex and the Wyoming specimen Dynamosaurus imperiosus. The second specimen was considered a separate animal because it had been found with small lumps of bony armor, called osteoderms, which were assumed to have covered the body as in the ankylosaurian dinosaurs. A year later, Osborne recognized the two specimens belonged to the same animal. Those pesky armor pieces did not belong to a theropod and had simply washed into the bone bed. Since both names were created and published in the same publication and at the same time, Osborne chose Tyrannosaurus rex as the first name and thus the valid name because it was printed on the page before Dinosaurus imperiosus. T-Rex is certainly a little easier to say, but Dinosaurus is still such a cool name. Manispondylus comes back into the story in 1917. Osborne once again revisited the Tyrannosaurs, and in this publication, with the Bulletin of the American Museum of Natural History, he validated the research of Hatcher. Yes, this thing did belong to a theropod dinosaur. More importantly, he compared the most important anatomical traits between the vertebra and the same type of vertebra then known from Tyrannosaurus. That basically confirmed to him that it was so similar to the vertebra of Tyrannosaurus that if it wasn't one, then it was essentially a species or subspecies. The thing was that the vertebra was just so dang weathered that it was basically indeterminate by definition. So Manispondylus gigas died then and there. Oh yeah. I switched from saying vertebrae to vertebra because at some point between 1892 and 1917, the second vertebra had gone missing, so only one survives to this day. This would have been the last of the great M. Gigas were it not for the simple fact of when it was described and what was found over a century later. By the dawn of the 2000s, the name Tyrannosaurus rex seemed like it had finally achieved total security. Then the fossil world was reminded that naming rules can still reach back and stir up old ghosts. The long dormant name, Manispondylus gigas, suddenly re-entered the picture. In 1999 and 2000, the Black Hills Institute carried out excavations not far from the very site where Cope had collected his original vertebrae. Their team uncovered an impressive handful of T-Rex bones, catalogued as BHI-6248 and nicknamed E.D. Cope. At first, it seemed like just another great addition to the long list of Tyrannosaur discoveries, but the quarry's location stirred an interesting possibility. It sat almost on top of Cope's original collecting site, which may have meant that both fossils might have belonged to the same individual animal. If that link had been solid, the implications could have been huge. Since Cope had coined Manospondylus gigas decades before Osborne named Tyrannosaurus rex, that older name would technically have priority under the rules of zoological nomenclature. In other words, the most famous dinosaur in the world might have been stripped of the name everyone knew and reassigned to something much clumsier to say. The media loved it. Science magazines and newspapers jumped at the idea that T-Rex might be doomed to wander under the banner of Manispondylus forevermore. It was flashy, was disruptive, and it made for eye-catching headlines. 
Paleontologists, though, responded with more skepticism than panic. The issue rested on a fragile assumption that the fragmentary vertebra Cope picked up in the 1890s and the much more complete BHI-6248 were parts of the same dinosaur. An assumption that cannot be easily proven because a specimen unearthed close to another one doesn't automatically prove biological identity. Fossil beds often act like packed time capsules, where animals of many species and from different years of deposition end up mixed together. Unless bones can be directly connected to a single skeleton, their proximity doesn't mean much. Additionally, Cope's vertebra was too worn, too incomplete, and too featureless to tie firmly to BHI-6248, let alone the species Tyrannosaurus rex. That's why Osborne determined it too indeterminate to be a valid species. Without diagnostic overlap, the case for Manus Bondylus replacing Tyrannosaurus never really left the realm of speculation. Even though the scientific justification for the case was thin, the scare acted as a wake-up call. If something as culturally and scientifically important and central as the label T-Rex could be threatened by a half-erased name from the 19th century, then the entire system of naming risked instability. The International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature, or ICZN, is, quote, an organization dedicated to, quote, achieving stability and sense in the scientific naming of animals, end quote, and is the governing body of what is or is not valid and how we should go about classifying organisms living or extinct. It was around this exact period of T-Rex's questionable stability that the ICZN updated its code to emphasize stability over sheer seniority. The 50-year rule was introduced. If a name had been continuously and widely used in scientific literature for at least half a century, it would be shielded from being displaced by an older, obscure name. The rule went into effect as of January 1st, 2000. Conveniently, Tyrannosaurus rex had been in use since 1905 without interruption, easily clearing the threshold. The ICZN's safeguard did more than protect one name, it underscored a central principle. Paleontology doesn't only serve specialists, it communicates to students, museums, media, and the public. If names changed every time an old scrap of bone got re-evaluated, the field would turn incoherent and decades of accumulated knowledge would become impossible to navigate. There are even cases that agree with this rule that are still huge messes, like Megalosaurus. I mean, it should technically be called Scrotum Humanum, but that name had not been used after 1899, is a senior synonym or senior homonym, and Megalosaurus Bucklandii had been used in over 25 publications for over 50 years after the old name. Stability is not just bureaucracy, it's what makes scientific language usable. In this case, those rules preserved more than textbooks. They maintained consistency across exhibits, field guides, and cultural storytelling built on T-Rex. The near miss of the early 2000s demonstrated something larger than a single dinosaur's label. Reliable names are the backbone of how we share new discoveries and interpret old ones. Even in the face of fragmentary fossils like Cope's vertebra, the balance between evidence and consistency ensures that the story of prehistoric life remains accessible. And while T-Rex emerged unscathed, the episode is a reminder that even the smallest, most unassuming bones can test the entire naming system, forcing us to consider how fragile those foundations really are. In the end, this debate over names reminds us why the rules exist in the first place. A single misidentified vertebra launched more than a century of obscure confusion, and without safeguards built for stability, the most famous predator in history could have been saddled with a name too clumsy for anyone outside of specialists to care about, and with a history so steeped in a different name as to make research effectively a goose chase through hundreds of papers. Instead, Tyrannosaurus rex emerged stable, a clear and memorable label that anchors both science and pop culture. So if there's one takeaway, it's that even battered fossils carry outsized influence, and the names we give them can shape our entire view of ancient life. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.